Well, good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending upon where you are in the world, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. I'm Charlene O'Hanlon, moderator for the event, and I welcome you. As always, we have a great webinar on tap, but before we get started, we do have a few housekeeping items we need to go over. First of all, today's event is being recorded, so if you miss any or all of the event, you will be able to access it later on demand. Following today's webinar, we will be sending out an email that contains a link to access the webinar. And we are taking questions for, from the audience. So if at any time you have a question for our panelists, please don't wait, don't hesitate, just use your GoToWebinar control panel and submit your questions, and we'll take as many as we can near the end of today's webinar. We're also going to be doing a drawing for three $50 Amazon gift cards at the end of today's webinar, so please stick around. Hopefully, you'll be one of our three lucky winners. And finally, we are going to have two quick polls at the end of today's webinar, so please, uh, we invite you to uh, take part in those polls as well. All right, with that, we'll go ahead and kick off today's webinar, which is Helm 3, Navigating to Distant Shores. Our speaker today is Jessica Dean, who is a Senior Cloud Advocate at Microsoft. Welcome, Jessica. Thanks for joining me today. Thank you very much. I'm going to quickly go out of full screen here so I can turn my camera on. I have no mouse otherwise. Now I'll go back to this. Hi, everyone. Uh, I know you can't talk back, but I'm going to pretend that there's a roaring hello in the audience. Um, Thank you very much to DevOps.com uh, and CodeFresh as well for having me and inviting me to chat with everyone about Helm 3. Uh, so today's session obviously is supposed to be about navigating to distant shores. There is some assumption that you're familiar with Helm, uh, you're using Helm of some form or fashion, and I'm gonna make an assumption that you've probably been using Helm somewhere in your journey from Helm 2, whether that's 2.0, all the way up to you started using Helm 2.14. whatever last week. Um, and wherever you are in your journey is perfectly fine because the session is gonna be talking about Helm 3 and what's different between the two. So here's an outline, or as some might call it, spoilers. Before we actually talk about the meat and potatoes of Helm 3, and then more importantly, how to use it in your maybe existing DevOps pipelines or start getting prepared for Helm 3 GA, because it is still in beta, we're gonna talk about the why. We're gonna go back to how Helm actually started and why it was created, so we can understand what really took place in the discussion for Helm 3 and why Helm 3 was needed, because it's very different than Helm 2. Uh, now we're gonna, after we talk about the why, of course, we'll go into actually an overview of version three, but then we're gonna deep dive into it. We're gonna talk about really technical details, things that changed, things that you should be aware of, especially as you start your journey. That'll include new features. And then at the end, we'll kind of wrap up with what's next and we'll answer some questions. So for anybody, we're, again, no matter where you are in your journey, Helm is the package manager for Kubernetes. In fact, I think the open source community right now very much believes that Helm is the package manager for Kubernetes. There are other tools you can kind of use and maybe some people write their own operators, but Helm is really the preferred way to distribute your Kubernetes packages and infrastructure. It is the best way to find, share, and use software that was specifically and intentionally built for Kubernetes. But how did it get here? First off, even at the conversation when Helm, which started by the way, one version started at a company hackathon for a company called Deus almost four years ago, actually four years ago this month. One of the things that the four people in that little hackathon started to talk about is what problem do they wanna solve? If we create a tool like Helm, what are we trying to simplify? We know that containers solve problems, right? We're trying to have a consistent development and something that's repeatable that I can reuse, rinse, and repeat. And containers brought us that. But it also brought a lot of problems with it. That was where the need for orchestration kind of came in. Because for as many problems as containers solve, they don't solve all the problems. And I love this particular graphic because I tend to look very calm while there's a whole bunch of chaos going on, usually in the background. Usually I'm standing like this. 
But we know that we have to kind of solve for this, especially in production-based scenarios and large-scale environments. How can we start really administering or orchestrating all of these containers that we're deploying? And again, we're kind of going back in the time to four years ago or so. I love this particular uh, tweet as well. We replaced our monolith with microservices. So every outage could be more like a murder mystery. Again, for as amazing as containers are and for how much they simplify, there's a lot of abstraction that leads, a lot of, leads to a lot of confusion. And so that's where really the discussion around Helm originated. How can we kind of make an on-ramp to this orchestrator for Kubernetes? How can we make getting into Kubernetes from a production-based scenario simpler? And so thus Helm was born, right? Helm was born in four years ago, it was 2015. And that was the Deus project. That was, Deus was a company that Microsoft acquired, I think about two years ago, but that was their hackathon project that ultimately came to fruition. However, if you've been using Helm since version two, you're actually using a merger of two different code bases. You're using Deus code and Google code. So things start getting a little bit even more murder mystery like when you take two different companies code, you take four years ago predated things like CRDs and RBAC or uh, custom resource definitions and role-based access control. So we're taking a lot of things from historical perspective and really trying to juggle all of this. It really brings us back to the previous slide where things start falling over again. So if we go back and think of what the four main points that Helm was designed to do, even from Helm V2, we wanted to manage complexity, we wanted to be able to support easy updates, we wanted to make sure that sharing was simple and we could have an easy way to roll back our Kubernetes deployments. The only problem is, is as these things started coming out, like role-based access control, security, production use cases, custom resource definitions, cases we're trying to manage, we're not necessarily manage, managing complexity, we're adding complexity. We're not making updates easy, we're making them a little bit more complicated, especially when you're having to consider your security. And after I think it was Kubernetes version 1.6, uh, with RBAC support, then we had to start dealing with Tiller and creating a service account for Tiller and putting it into specific namespaces. That's not making updates easy. That's also not making it very simple to share because I don't know what security protocols are needed for which chart. And if I'm rolling things back, how do I handle rolling back things that were role-based access control defined, pod security budgets? There's so many new parts of Kubernetes that came out that any of the features Helm was trying to support in version two was really kind of being bolted on after the fact. So those were some considerations when it came down into the discussion for version three. It is based on community best practices. So in short, if you're watching this right now, Version three is based on the feedback that you, as the community, have given online, be it in issues, in pull requests, in conversation with engineers, if you go to conferences, we really wanted to focus on the best practices that you were focusing on. And we wanted to focus on them from a production-based scenario. So you'll hear me say production a lot and security a lot, because that was a lot of the things that was lacking in our V2 journey, right? We also wanted to make things significantly more simple, especially since, as I said, we have two different code bases. We needed to account for security in Tiller and RBAC and all these other things that started to make our simple intention very complicated. So there were some architectural changes that were also designed for V3. Specifically, we put security priority. That became one of our first things that we really wanted to focus on. So the best way you can think of version three, if you're considering it now and wanting to play with it, is it is simpler, it is more secure, and it is, pardon me, it is based on production use cases. So what does that mean? That means that in order to get to where we are today in, in version three, and we'll, we'll walk through a demo of it, we needed to actually do a major refactor of our code. We can't sit there and start tacking on more things just as we had been. There's code that was outdated, that was archaic. Like I said, it was a merger of a Google project and a Deus project. We needed to kind of revamp the entire code base. 
primarily because, as I said, Helm is almost as old as K, uh, Kubernetes or K8s. Helm came out, the first version was October of 2014, and then in May of 2013 was when Kubernetes came out, because in May of this year, they just celebrated their fifth year anniversary or birthday, whichever you want to call it. And we already talked on how it predated CRDs and RBAC. So we wanted to consider that. Helm 3, we really focused on replacing custom APIs for charts and deployments with secrets. Now, what does that mean? That means that previously, when you do your updates, when I say Helm upgrade install X chart, right? It's going to store that upgrade history. It's going to store it in a config map. It's going to have data stored kind of locally. There's a client component and a server side component with Tiller. But now we're actually going to communicate directly with the Kubernetes API. And all of that updates and all of those uh, release history information actually gets stored now as a secret object in Kubernetes. And we'll talk about why. But remember that a lot of the decisions, security is at the, the highest priority. So a lot of the reasons for putting it in a secret object comes into security being one of those reasons. As a result of being able to communicate directly with the Kubernetes API and not having a middleman like Tiller in between, it now makes Helm more Kubernetes native because now it's just Helm 3 becomes a client side tool. The spoiler that everyone knows by now is Tiller is no more. There is no Tiller. So now Helm just communicates with Kubernetes and Kubernetes APIs directly. As a result, because there's no Tiller, there's no setting up with Helm init and setting a service account and figuring out which namespace Tiller is installed to. Instead, whatever security controls your local system gets or your build server gets or whatever you're using for your your pipeline or whatever's running Helm. It's going to get your secu security controls from kubeconfig and that's it. That's where you're going to get, you're not going to have to define anything extra. So it's going to use Kubernetes role-based access control. Whatever permissions you grant to use, that's going to be what Helm has access to. So you're not going to have to manage different security principles across two different tools. Obviously, I already gave the spoiler away. We gave it away in May when we first talked about the very first alpha release, but Tiller is no more. As a result, this allows for significantly more flexible architecture. We really can focus on security because now I don't have security over here for Tiller. I'm not creating cluster role bindings or admin accounts or anything. I'm just, again, using what is natively defined for Kubernetes makes it easier for upgrades and more secure. Remember, we talked about the four things that Helm was intended to do. We wanted to manage complexity. We wanted to make for easy updates, easy sharing. This is gonna make all of that not only easier, but significantly more secure. I've already mentioned on how Helm is now gonna communicate with the Kubernetes API directly. It's gonna render charts client side, and it's gonna store it in release. It's gonna store it in secret objects because we've removed this very big middleman, Tiller in the middle, it actually lowers the barrier for contributions. So from a community perspective, especially since Helm 3 is based on community best practices, it makes it easier for you as the community to get involved with the project if you wanted to. The easiest way to think about the primary changes that happen in Helm 3 is there's no more need to have cluster admin privileges. You don't have to sit there and worry about defining that and figure out what you assign to which version of Tiller or which version of Helm. You don't have to install Tiller into every namespace. And as I mentioned, Helm uses the settings and access that you define in your local Kubernetes config. That's it. It's so much simpler. There are some CLI changes, but they're not breaking changes, okay? So Helm delete, Helm fetch, Helm inspect now have become different, they're, they're technically aliases, but they've become Helm uninstall, Helm show, and Helm pull with the intention to be more Kubernetes native. In fact, if you're familiar with obviously Helm 2 and you do Helm delete, if I wanted to fully delete, including any of the history, I previously had to use a dash dash purge flag. Now that's actually the default behavior in Helm uninstall. Instead, if I really want to keep the histories, I can override the default behavior using Helm uninstall dash dash keep history. It's just a lot easier to understand. It's a lot more native. Uh, and again, if you mess up, I've done it. Helm delete is an alias for Helm uninstall. 
same with inspect and show, and same with fetch and pull. But now we're gonna talk about things that broke because we've kind of talked about the big things. We know we're focusing on security. We know we're focusing on production use cases. Uh, there were some CLI changes, but what broke? We removed a really big part of till there. We refactored a bunch of stuff. What does that mean for how the product actually works or how the tool actually works? First off, since you no longer need to initialize your Helm instance, you no longer need to set up a service account, Helm init, that command has been removed. There's no need for it anymore. Uh, another big change is configuration directories and repositories where Helm used to live, which used to be in your home directory slash dot Helm. That's now been changed as well. And it's changed to actually be more standard across open source projects. So we'll talk about that in the next few slides. In case you're wondering how your Helm instance gets set up now without Helm init, when you install Helm itself, it's gonna set up any of those configuration directories if they don't already exist. If you're updating your version of Helm 3, it's just gonna go ahead and leave the, the directories that you already have. But it'll automatically create it for you upon installation of Helm. And I've written a little script for you to use to make that really easy. So I already told you that the Helm directory used to be located off of the user's home directory. And I told you we've now made it a little bit more standard across open source projects. It now follows what's called the XDG specification. There's links online where you can look up what XDG is and what problems it solves, but I'm gonna walk through how it pertains to the Helm project in particular. So for example, for base directory specifications, for single base directories when it comes to Helm, user-specific data files are gonna be stored in the XDG data home environment variable. Uh, and you'll actually see this as well when you do uh, Helm help or in my demo, I'm gonna use H3 because I like typing as little as possible and I still have Helm 2 installed on my system. So Helm 2 is still Helm and then Helm 3 is H3 and we'll talk about that. But if I do H3 help, I'm gonna be able to see all of these environment variables. So we talked about config home, that's where my configuration files are stored, my non-essential, my cache data is gonna be stored in cache home, my runtime data is stored in runtime dir. It's a lot, again, it's a lot more simpler, it's a lot more standard. Uh, in fact, even your preferences have the same thing as well. So my data directories are gonna have preference ordered base directories, and my configure directories are also gonna be preference ordered configuration file directories as well. And here's a little example of what you're gonna see. So this is that if I did Helm or H3 help, I would see all the environment variables. I can set alternate locations, but by default, cache directories are gonna be stored in these particular file paths. You'll also notice in this particular example that we now have an output to include Linux, Mac, and Windows. Originally, Helm was written kind of very focused on Linux. This now allows us to make it a little bit easier as a cross-platform tool as well, especially since Windows containers is becoming significantly more popular and is now supported in Kubernetes as of 1.14. Another big change, which isn't so much of a breaking change, but it's another thing to be aware of, is you can now use JSON schemas and you can impose that on chart values and you can bundle it directly with a chart. You can even use JSON schemas for validating your chart values as well. This is a big change, and this is a breaking change, so to speak, because there's some history behind it that you're gonna to wanna to be aware of. So by default, if I were to install Helm 2 right now, I have a stable repo that I can sit there and use, and I can install any chart from the stable upstream Helm chart directory, right, from the GitHub project or I think it's hub.kubapps.com. I can install any of those charts because they're hosted in the stable repo. That's no longer included by default. In fact, by default, once you've installed Helm 3, you don't have any repos. So you're gonna have to add the repos that you want, be it stable, incubator, jet stack, your own repos. The reason for that is the Helm project is moving to a more distributed model of repositories. And over the life of Helm 3, the stable repository will actually be deprecated. And now you'll ha start having a more distributed model, kind of like Docker Hub, where each individual project, be it Jenkins or Nginx, they're all gonna start managing their own repos. So it really creates more of this community atmosphere rather than just 
one project has these set of charts. And so you'll be able to search for your, your charts uh, on the Helm Hub as well. There's also some namespace changes. So previously using Helm 2, if I do Helm LS, I'm gonna get an output of all the charts that I have installed, regardless of what namespace I'm currently running my commands against, right? In, in my demo, I actually have my Kubernetes cluster that you can see, as well as the namespace. So you'll be able to see kind of how that changes. But now each release is gonna default to a single namespace. So if I do Helm 3 or H3 install, and I specify my install command, it's gonna install into whatever namespace I'm either working in or whatever namespace I define. So it's gonna create all the resources in the same namespace as the release, same with the secrets. Uh, and that's the release history. Right now, if I'm using Helm 2 and I do a K get, uh, what is it? That right now in Helm 2, they're stored in config maps. So if I do K get config maps, I'm actually gonna see all of those objects regardless of what namespace because they're stored in kube system. Now it's gonna keep everything a lot more organized, a lot more secure. But as a result, because the release history also moves, you have to use a plugin to upgrade a Helm 2 release with Helm 3. I can't just take a Helm 2 release and say, okay, go ahead and up and have it work. Uh, but I will show you how to use the plugin. It's very easy. And there's actually some uh, dry run checks that you can tie in before you go and just blow away any of your Helm 2 stuff and move to Helm 3. Here's an example of that plugin. It's called 2 to 3. Now this is a Helm 2 plugin, right? Because you're actually gonna be migrating your release history or your config maps from version two over to version three. So I'm gonna install it using my Helm 2 alias. Uh, that detail sometimes gets a little bit confusing because we have two different versions of Helm floating around, but I'll do Helm for V2, two to three, convert. And then initially I always recommend using the dry run flag. That way I know what's gonna be created. I do a dry run and I specify the name of the release. And the demo I'll do today and the demo that you're seeing on screen right now that says Croc Hunter, that's actually a release that I haven't touched since May. Uh, and it's six months old. It was probably, I'm assuming probably Helm 2.12 if I'm going back that far. And I can still migrate it over to Helm 3 and I can still then upgrade any of those releases with uh, a DevOps pipeline. So we'll talk about that. After you see what changes from your dry run, you can remove that dry run flag and actually do the real release. Now the real release will create secret objects for your Helm 3, but it's not gonna delete anything of your release history from Helm 2 until you use another command to delete it. You could do it all as one command with another flag to delete and remove any existing versions, but I don't recommend that, that right now. Remember, Helm 3 is still in beta. I would walk through the checks and balances and go through best practices. So I've told you on how release information is stored server-side as a secret object. Here's an example of an Nginx release. And if I do k get secrets or kube control, kube cuddle, whatever way you feel like pronouncing, if I do get secrets and specify the namespace, I'm gonna see the .v1, .v2, .v3, and I'm gonna see that spit back out as my secret object. In fact, it'll even be tagged as a helm.sh release object. Chart dependency management has also received some changes. So the old style was I would specify any dependencies in my requirements YAML, and I would have an associated requirements.lock file. Requirements is now gone. So that I, I'm, requirements has been removed. Now I'm gonna specify any dependencies in my chart.yaml and my chart.lock. So if you already are using Helm 2 in production with chart dependencies, you're gonna to wanna to test this part out in Helm 3. You're gonna to wanna to test it extensively because there could be breaking changes if you rely on Helm dependency subcommands, especially as part of your pipeline. There's also a new API version that's available. So previously when I would under the chart YAML, I didn't have to specify any kind of API version. Now there's an API version two. So I, I can specify this, I technically don't need to, but note the air quotes. If I were to rely as part of my DevOps process, as part of my pipeline on linting my chart, which you should always lint your chart, and I'm linting with Helm 3, I will get a failure because now the linting process for Helm 3 is going to expect an API version be defined. So I'll show you an example, it's one simple line, I can say V1 or V2. 
Uh, I told you about the requirements on how it's now going to be listed in chart.yaml. There's also been changes to CRDs. So remember, Helm 2 predated CRDs and predated RBAC. So in Helm 3, we really had to consider how we're going to handle CRDs themselves. As a result, in V2, a CRD directory is now going to be added to your charts directory where you can place any of the CRDs will then be applied prior to rendering your templates themselves. So if you rely on install hooks, be aware that the CRD install hook has been removed and it won't work for Helm V2 charts. Now that doesn't mean you can't use a V1 chart with it, but you will also have to consider as you migrate uh, over to Helm 3 that you'll have to use a legacy plugin to support V1 charts with the CRD CRD install hook just because Helm 3 won't recognize it. Along with that, Helm search has also changed. Helm search has been refactored to now have subcommands. Previously, I would just type Helm search and get a list of any of my charts, but now I can actually use additional subcommands to search both my local repos and Helm hub. Remember on how from a charts directory and a distribution model, we're moving to something that is more distributed rather than just upstream from one location. Helm serve has also been removed. My, my belief as to why it was per, uh, removed was Helm serve really only helped me from a local perspective. It's no better than it works on my machine but it doesn't help me test from a more distributed model perspective, right? I can now put my chart that I want to test in either a public Helm repo or a private Helm repo, and I can test it more reliably, both on my local system and as part, and as part of my pipeline, and know that there's nothing special that I have configured here to make it work over here in my build server. It's just more globally distributed, globally available. So if you were one of the developers that relied on Helm serve, you're going to have to adjust your development practices accordingly. Helm test also receives some major refactoring. So now it includes the test success hooks behavior, and then they're going to be more in line with what you would expect from other hooks. As a result, we also remove the test failure hook primarily because no one was, there was a significant lack of use. I don't want to say no one if you were using it, but we really wanted to focus again on the feedback we were hearing from you, and we wanted to make sure that we applied that appropriately in Helm 3. Another big change to Helm 3, and I think this really opens the door to a lot of future potential, is there's actually experimental feature gates that are now supported. So you can enable certain experimental features using an environment variable. Uh, and as they're added to Helm, you would just enable that environment variable and be able to, to test out that feature. An example is going to be with OCI charts. So you, Helm 3 now supports OCI registries. And if you want to learn more about OCI registries, there's actually a great session and the slides are already online. I think the session record is already online. It's another 45 minute session, but it's from Josh Dolinsky at Helm Summit. I strongly recommend checking that out to learn more about OCI. But if you wanted to play with it in Helm 3 now, you can, all you have to do is set the environment variable, Helm underscore experimental underscore OCI. And you set that to one for true, if you want to turn it off, set it to zero. Another big change is previously, if I would do Helm install or Helm upgrade install, I could just specify the chart name and chart repository and hit enter. And it would give me sometimes a funny name, right? It'd give me jumping turtle or dancing squirrel. Now that's no longer going to be the default behavior. In fact, if I don't specify a name and if I don't use the generate name flag, I'm going to get an error. So I need to either use dash dash generate name or I need to provide a name. So that's another big change. Primarily again, because we're trying to consider things from a production use case scenario. Chances are in production, you're not gonna use fuzzy bear, right? You're gonna actually have to specify a name. If you're doing development testing and you're playing locally, you can say generate a name for me because you don't care. But most of the time people are gonna be getting into best practices. Now let's talk about some excitement, some new features, right? I don't wanna just be a downer with all these things that kind of changed. Now also in Helm 3, we're iterating on the Helm Chart Repository API. So you heard me mention OCI and mentioned another session that talks about OCI registries. We are working on being fully compatible with o the OCI standard. As a result, we will eventually be able to support pluggable authentication, novel artifact types, 
you can already host your Helm charts on ACR, which is Azure's Container Registry. But right now, even the if you host your Helm repos, right now they're private. You can set it to be public, but then you have to set your entire container registry to be public, and it's a little complicated. So as a result, we really set up code to support future OCI standard scaling. There's also library chart support, and these are charts that are shared by other charts. They don't actually create any release artifacts of their own. Instead, it's a template that can be used to define elements. This allows for simpler code re reuse. Now, what does that mean? Let's say I wanted to say all of my charts need to have a pod security uh, standard, or they need to have a pod disruption budget, or they need to have these definitions. I can link that library chart over to the charts that I'm working on, that I want those standards applied, and I can have my library chart define those elements for my working charts or my production charts. Now, if you want, you can take a, a picture either of your screen, uh, though I know it's potentially hard if you actually want to go to the link from your screen. If you're typing, if you're working from a computer, you can type in github.com forward slash JL Dean, no relation to James Dean, J-L-D-E-E-N, slash Helm3 slash demo. And we're going to go into a real live demo where you see this stuff kind of in action. So I'll switch over here. And I'm going to click on. So if you've gone to that link and you can see I have it up here right here on my right. This is a public repo. Everything I ever demo is public, so there's no secrets or surprises here. And I routinely update this repo. I also accept pull requests because I've given this at several different events, and I'm hugely passionate about open source community, Helm, Kubernetes, and I believe that code is better when we work together. So I've already accepted a few pull requests from the community to help improve this demo and improve this tutorial. If you'd like to submit, please do. But for now, we're gonna kind of walk through Helm 3, and actually this says alpha, this should say beta, but we're gonna walk through Helm 3 beta 4. That's currently the stage that we're in. And we'll talk about the different things at the end that changed from alpha 1 all the way over to beta 4. But I set this repo up primarily as a workspace, not only for me to show you stuff, but for you to go off and kind of play with and learn on your own. If you don't have a highly available Kubernetes cluster, and you'd like to play with one on Azure, there's install scripts available for you to play with it on AKS. In fact, I have the scripts over here. I'll set up your AKS cluster for you. All you have to do is define out your variables and give it a cluster name, how many nodes you want, and it'll go off and create everything, including monitoring, application routing. It'll do the same thing with, Helm, with Azure Storage and most importantly, Helm 3. So I wrote this because right now you can go to Helm the Helm repo, I believe that's right here, and you can click on, this is actually Helm 2 to 3, but you can go to the Helm project and you can get releases and download it manually, install it manually. I thought it would be a lot easier just to have an install script. The beautiful part about this script is line five right here. Anytime there's a new release, all I have to do is change the beta version. And then as a result, the script will run. It'll wget to pull that down. It'll extract it. It'll make sure to back up anything that you already have if you had a pre-existing Helm 3. I have used this script since Alpha 1, so for five versions now, I haven't had any issues. Uh, I'm also going to export any kind of Helm Home directories just to make sure I don't override anything with Helm 2. And most importantly, I set a temp alias because, again, the new Helm 3 still says Helm. I have Helm 2 installed on my system. I just set an alias to H3. And I'm a huge fan of ZSH. You can see my terminal down here. Uh, and so I echo that alias out to my ZSH. If you're using Bash or you're using Linux, this is on Mac, or you're using Windows, you'll have to update this accordingly. And then of course, as a good uh, developer, I clean up the install so you don't have any kind of tar files or anything here. I always recommend reading every script before you run through it. But in short, and I've already run this, you would just do scripts, and you would hit enter to go ahead and run your script. But since I've already done that, we're just going to go ahead and run through Helm I, as though you've also already installed Helm 3 as well. So the first thing I want to do is show you that I'm running Helm 3. So if I cancel out of this and I do Helm version or H3 version, you're going to see right there that I have beta 4, right? Beta 4 is installed. By the way, also the first part of the demo, I'm doing just on a local Kubernetes cluster. I'm not even touching the cloud. I just want to get everyone comfortable with using Helm 3 before we start playing with cloud. 
You're also going to notice if I do Helm repo ls, which by the way, the list command was just recently added in beta 4, I can now see if any repos that I have. This is acting as though it's a completely clean install. I don't have any repos. So the first thing I'm going to have to do is install this repo. And if you want more of a tutorial, this notes is available in the repo. But if you want to walk through it as more of a tutorial, the tutorial guide is on the markdown file. And I will walk you through everything step by step as well. So whatever your learning preference is. So I'm going to go ahead and copy this. I'll right click and hit copy. And I'm just going to go ahead and paste this in and hit that did not work because it copied wrong. All right. There we go. This way and it copied again sorry about this there and let me go keeps copying okay i'm gonna do h3 repo add and we'll do stable there we go and it's going to add that stable repo stable has now been added so now if i do an h3 repo ls i see the stable repo i can do the same thing which h3 repo add incubator and incubator has now been added, repo ls. So those commands still work the same. The beautiful part is, is now I can go ahead and run through my commands just as I normally would. So here, there we go, paste this in. So if I run an H3 upgrade install, this is for an Nginx chart, you're noticing that I'm giving it a name and I'm still specifying stable Nginx ingress. This now installed the chart the exact same way I would expect using H3 or Helm 3. In fact, I can even, let me undo this. There we go. I can go down here and I can do K get pods. And you're gonna see, here's my containers that are creating that are 17 seconds old. K get services. Uh, I think they're now 23 seconds old right here. My Kubernetes cluster looks like it's been up for 42 hours. But I can interact with Kubernetes and Helm the exact same way I, I'm used to. Another big popular chart, and this is actually part of the tutorial. If you run through this on a cloud-based cluster, you're, you're gonna walk through setting up an Nginx ingress controller. You're gonna walk through setting up a certificate manager and then even applying a cluster issuer. This is the same kind of stuff that you would do for a Let's Encrypt Nginx proxy Kubernetes cluster using Helm 2. You can do the same charts using Helm 3. So all I would do is H3 repo add, and we'll do Jetstack this time, hit enter, and now I add that, that Jetstack repo. Now that that's been added, I can run this particular command to go ahead and do my, upstate, my install, my install of my certificate manager, and that's gonna install the certificate manager manually. Now, previously, you'd have to apply the CRDs. I left that in as optional in case you had any kind of breaking changes depending on what version of Kubernetes, but anytime I've run through this demo, I no longer need to apply these CRDs. The certificate manager uh, chart just works. I'm not sure if that's because of Helm 3 now or if that's because of the version of Kubernetes, but if you happen to play with it and figure it out, please do let me know. You can also submit a pull request. Now that I've gotten all that working, I can see how I have all these charts that have been around for several years working with Helm 2. They work just the same as with Helm 3, right? In fact, just to show you, I'm gonna clear real quick and I'm gonna do Helm version. And you're gonna notice I don't even have Tiller installed on this cluster. This is not a cluster that's meant to work with Helm at all, but I do have Helm 2 installed locally on my system. I'm gonna switch over now because we've kind of talked about cluster issuers. I can apply uh, charts and different things, but I wanna actually move over a little bit more to plugins. We've talked about repos. What about plugins? Can I still install plugins the same way that I'm used to? The answer is yes. Especially in beta 4, the Helm team really focused on porting over features that existed in Helm 2 and making sure they worked the same way in Helm 3. So I'll copy this plugin install and paste this right down here. And you can see I've previously already installed it, but I now have that Kubernetes valid. What I can use with that plugin is I can actually go to a pre existing chart. So if I CD over here and I go to I think I want to go to my charts directory. I can do a H3 kubeval, and you'll notice right down here that I'm actually running a replica count of equals 25. The only problem is, is this is a string, and my chart is going to expect an integer. 
So I can use this plugin to validate and see if what I want to set this value, controller.replica count, equals. This is a plugin that I would use in Helm 2. I can use it just the same way in Helm 3. So we'll go ahead and kind of scroll up. And in yellow right here, that is almost too hard to see, it says the file contains an invalid deployment. And scroll up one more time. You can see right here, the expected was integer and I gave it a string. So the plugin works the exact same way. I really liked that. I thought that was super helpful. Another thing I can do, which I love because I, I use a variety of different CI CD system tools in all of my demos, and you'll kind of see why. But if I wanted to deploy out my own Jenkins build servers for some reason, and that chart has existed for two or three years, I can run that the exact same way as I would, even with the exact same values file. You can see right here that this is using, um, whoops, I zoomed in way too much there, but this is using an old tag. This is 2.16.4. This is an old version of Jenkins. I can use this the exact same way as what I would with Helm 2. Copy this one more time. There we go. And hit enter. And actually, I'm not even in the right directory, so let me go back. It's always fun. There we go. And we'll go up one more time and do that command. And now it finds that chart and it'll be able to install Jenkins. Of course, it's doing that locally in my system. The real benefit from this is I want you to see that your workflow and the same commands you're used to running doesn't change. But now, actually, using it with a cloud-based cluster. So I'm gonna switch over to JDK8, uh, just regular, which is actually a cluster I've had for over a year now. It's a cluster where if I do Helm version, I have pretty sure 2.14, possibly 0.0, but I have an old version of Helm 2. Yeah, 2.14.0, I'm using client 2.14.3. And if I do k get pods dash n croc hunter, you're gonna see I have apparently nothing. Let me do K gets secrets. There we go. So I do have secrets there. Um, apparently there's no pods, I'm not quite sure why, but let's get deployment in the same. Hunter. Apparently nothing, but I have secrets there and that's fine. That's actually all I wanna show you because if I do config maps, you're gonna see all the different deployments that I have. All of this is old. You can see that some of these are 182 days old. I have OzCon Croc, I have Croc Hunter. These are the, the Croc Hunter versions, V1, V10, V11, V12, all the way up to V21. These are up to 226 days old. This is the old install. And this is where I wanna show you how I can actually port releases over. So I'll go here, I'm gonna clear. And the first thing I'm gonna do is go over to, we'll scroll down. You would install the Helm 2 plugin. I do that the same way I installed my kube validator. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run that, that convert command. This is the same command you saw in the slides. I'm gonna just click right here. I'll paste this in, Helm H2 to 3 dry one. It's gonna tell me these are all the secrets that'll be created. And remember, you just saw K get secrets here. I don't have anything here. I don't have release histories of anything. So if I wanna actually convert, I'm over here and I'll paste this in. And now it's saying it's gonna go ahead and create all of these releases. And I get a confirmation that those releases have been created. So if I get K get secrets now, I can see all of those release markers. If I do H3 LS, first off, I'm only gonna see any releases I have in my default namespace, which is Jenkins and Nginx. I don't have anything else that's fancy. But if I do H3, ls-n croc hunter i now have my croc hunter release i have the revision 21 i have the last time it was updated was may 21 so i was able to migrate that release history just using that plugin and as you can see now any of those release objects are stored per namespace that was one of those big changes so now i want to talk about once you get comfortable with using this locally how you can tie that over into an actual CI CD pipeline. I have one here in CodeFresh. And so this is an existing pipeline. I've taken this pipeline with me or, or truly around the world. And it's one that I've been using for probably almost a year now. I start off with cloning. I use several different tools 
JFrog Artifactory, JFrog X-rays for some binary scanning. I push over to Artifactory. I've done the same thing where I push to Azure Container Registry. I have Slack notifications that I trigger off. This is a really robust pipeline. And I didn't want to lose anything when it came down to moving from Helm 2 to Helm 3. After I migrate any of my existing deployments from Helm 2 to 3, and I have that release history, all I have to do to upgrade my pipeline is change one line of code. So I wanna show you that. This is the pipeline itself. I have a project called Java Test, and I have a pipeline right here. Now, for those of you who don't know, CodeFresh is a Kubernetes-specific CI-CD tool. They focus on Kubernetes for DevOps. In fact, if I go over here to the left-hand side here, you'll see that I have a bunch of different things. DevOps insights for Kubernetes, Helm. I can actually drill down into this and see Helm releases. I'll show you that in a second. I have pipelines, steps. The unique thing about how CodeFresh works when it comes down to my CI-CD pipeline is it uses containers for each step which makes my job from a Helm 3 migration significantly easier because I don't have to set up my build server with two different versions of Helm. I don't have to set aliases. I don't have to worry about what's happening where. I just change the container image. So you can see all of these different steps. You can see that I'm doing a clone. I'm doing a build. And this is actually a special image that I built. I have complete control over this pipeline. I give it a series of commands. I go through and I do a build of a Docker image. I can get any of these steps, by the way, from their steps tool. But the most important one is building, pushing. I told you about linting, the importance of linting a Helm chart. I package that Helm chart up. I push all this data somewhere. And then I want to actually deploy it, right? After I run my security scan, of course. The deployment is the very last step down here. And I want you to see, the only thing I changed, you can see lines 159 and 160, the only thing I changed was the image. I went from this code fresh step of 2.14.1, which is apparently the last version I was using for Helm for this deployment. I ran Helm 2 to 3, and then I changed this image right here to be beta 4. And all after I ran through it, everything uh, fired off, and it was a Helm 3 deployment. So you can see that right here. This is the same build that we were just looking at. And if I go into the deployment step, in fact, I'll make this just a little bit bigger here, and I'll scroll up, you can see on the layers, it was pulling that CF step helm beta four step. And it went through and it ran the release, it upgraded, it deployed. Now, why is this also cool? This is also cool because remember how helm init has been removed. So previously, if you have a helm step Add it in. Let's say you're using something in Jenkins or you're using Azure DevOps or Travis CI or any of these other tools. You're gonna have to consider how you account for authenticating your Kubernetes cluster with your pipeline itself, with your Helm step. You can, there is a flag that you can set your Kubernetes context and you can use that to override. But because CodeFresh actually has OAuth authentication connected to any major cloud, I'll show you that. I go over here to Kubernetes. I just clicked on my accounts. So I'll actually go back just so you can see a little bit more. Under settings, I clicked on account settings. I went over here to Kubernetes and I right now have Azure. I work for Microsoft, so I get free clusters. Uh, if you wanna give me anywhere else, I'll gladly add that in so we can do multi-cloud deployment. But you can see Google Cloud, you can see any kind of custom deployment. Maybe that was something like an unmanaged cluster custom providers, Stackpoint, IBM, EKS. The second you authenticate, I can see any clusters that I have available in my subscriptions, and I can even see nodes that I have available. And now I can just run those deployments across, and the Helm step works universally. You can see the way that I define the step, and I'm just gonna go back over to the pipeline here, where I just use custom variables. In fact, in CodeFresh's latest step release, I can even use a custom uh, values file but right down here at the bottom, all I'm doing after I set the image is I'm setting environment variables. I'm setting an image tag, I'm setting an image repository, an ingress host name, and a build ID. None of these environment variables changed when I changed the image. But if I were using something like Jenkins, which I also have deployed with the tutorial, by the way, you'll notice that this pipeline works beautifully. The downside is, is it's written, and here I'm actually gonna show you, I deployed this out with uh, Helm 3. So I'm going to switch over to my Helm 3 
cluster. I'm going to print this command, which is going to give me my admin password. It's super secret. Um, clearly, this is just used for demos, and don't worry, this will be uh, blasted away at the end. I'm going to paste that in, and I want to show you the pipeline that runs through, which is my Helm Summit branch. Everything is green. Everything looks great. The downside is I had to write it in Groovy, Groovy, so I have to program it. I have to use library files, and you'll notice it does a lot of things that my CodeFresh does. I compile, I test, I lint, I package, but there's no deployment because I have to figure out how to securely transfer my context or my config over to my CI CD server. But because I'm able to have that uh, account or my Azure account linked in through OAuth, that makes it a lot easier. I'll just show you around here. I can also see any Kubernetes clusters I have live and up to date. It'll give me a list of all my services. This is a cluster that, that I said that I've been using for over a year. And it has deployments from Helm 2, from Helm 3. It doesn't matter. I can see any of these releases and I still get a full output. In fact, I probably looking at this, I now have to clean it up. Uh, but you can also see any of my Helm releases. I think right now this still shows Helm 2, but uh, I believe CodeFresh is actively working on supporting uh, also showing Helm 3 releases as well. But I do like having that visual. I can drill down into any of these. I can see uh, any services if they're deployed in a replica set. This was just a simple one. I can see the history uh, so I can easily roll back, but this just gives me a lot of that insight. So I'm gonna switch back over here now to my keynote and I'm gonna hit play. And so now you're probably wondering what's next. I showed you how to do Helm two to three. I can run through and use the same charts. Uh, by the way, uh, one thing I didn't show, actually I'll exit this real quick and I want to show you, this release was a release that I deployed for Croc Hunter. This is that Croc Hunter you can deploy out your very own, it's part of the tutorial. But this release was done from Helm 3 and I actually like it because I get to use little Helm 3 logos. Um, but this was live and fully deployed through a full end-to-end -end CI CD pipeline. Uh, it can only, you you kind of know when it's running through a pipeline because it gets any of this commit IDs through an environment variable that I pass in as a build argument and I can do it manually, but it's so much easier to throw it in as a pipeline. So now I just want to go back. Now that you've seen how I can use old charts, how I can use old plugins, I can still use existing pipelines. And what I also wanted to say about Croc Hunter is I show that chart in particular because that's one of the oldest charts. That chart has been around probably since almost the very beginning. It was originally written by Lockie Evanson, who's a principal PM on the AKS team and was one of the original members, I believe, of the Deus team. I specifically use that because I want to show how backwards compatible Helm 3 really is. I'm taking something that's almost four years old. I'm still deploying it. I changed one line of code and it works beautifully. So now if you're wondering what's next, let's make sure that we kind of have a recap of everything we've done from the Helm team thus far. We know that Alpha 1, the big secret, was that it was tillerless. We started setting up scaffolding for library charts, secret storage. Alpha 2, we added in some OCI package, install and dependency updates. Beta 1 supported three-way merge upgrades, supported some XDG changes for that home directory. It also officially added the feature gate for OCI integration. Beta 2 for improving those error messages. Uh, and beta 2, fun fact, beta 2's pull requests that were ultimately merged in were entirely community-based. So I think that really shows an example of just how community-focused this project is. Beta 3 focused on more bug fixes, caching, help text, and beta 4, which was just released about nine days ago, focused on security. They actually addressed a CVE issue that's in their release notes, focused on more bug fixes, they ported, they ported over quite a bit of features from Helm 2, and there were additional CLI enhancements, primarily around uh, Helm repo. I could now do lists. I can now see, um, there's a few more commands. List is the first one that comes to mind. Uh, but that's really kind of where we are. Before we hit GA, we're really focusing on making sure all the security features are ported over and bug fixes are addressed. So that's where it comes into you. Please get involved. Come reach out to us on our fact page. You can also contribute to the docs. They're open source on helm dub And you can click on the dev-v3 branch and you can make pull requests. 
You can also check out helm.sh for community calls. And perhaps the biggest thing ever is we really want feedback on our beta release. If you find something that is not backwards compatible with your existing charts, please reach out to us. We'd love to hear about new use cases from a production scenario that we haven't considered, new workflows that we're not aware of. We really just wanna make sure that we are delivering the Helm 3 that you as the community have been asking for. Finally, I'm Jessica Dean. I'm a cloud advocate at Microsoft. At my core, aside from talking on cameras or on stage, I'm truly an engineer. So I've submitted a pull request to Upstream Helm as well, as well as other projects. Uh, if you're curious about my terminal, my dot files are on my GitHub. I love hanging out with other engineers. I love communicating with other engineers. So I also love Star Wars and Disney and CrossFit. How do you how do you know someone's a CrossFitter? They'll tell you. Uh, I love all fitness though, really. So feel free to reach out to me on any subject. If you want to learn more, you can check out what is Kubernetes, at aka a.ms, K8 Learning. You can check out more about cloud native tooling at Deus Labs. All of my Helm 3 demo code, which is regularly updated, is at the repo link I gave you earlier. And if you're curious about multi node and multi operating system, Ralph Squalachi, who's also a PM for the AKS team, has a great repo called Helm Multi Node you can check out as well. And then finally, I know we have probably just about five more minutes, unless my watch is slow, but thank you very much. I'll try to answer a, a few questions. All right, great. Yeah, we do have a few questions, a few minutes here for questions. But uh, before we get to the questions, I want to uh, mention that we do have the two polls. I want to push them out real quick. Here's the first of the two poll, uh, two polls. Uh, how did this webinar meet your expectations? So you can go ahead and select one of the following. Yes, that was awesome. Yes, this is what I expected, or not exactly. So go ahead and get your. Um, Get your answers in for that and then we'll go ahead and uh, we'll close this one in about five seconds and then we'll move on to the next poll and then we'll do our questions okay I'm gonna go ahead and close this one out the next one is what where you go okay so here is the second poll which is do you want to try code fresh yes let's schedule a one-to-one -to, -one to help me get started yes i will try it on my own now right now or i don't really understand what code fresh does so go ahead and get your uh, answers in for that and then we'll uh, try to get to as many questions as we can i think because of the uh, short time i think we're only going to be able to get to one but we'll see what we can do for you okay i'm going to go ahead and close this poll now and uh, let's dive right on into uh, our first question here uh, let's see, I run several GitLab runners in separate namespaces for expense visibility. With this change in, um, looks like single, uh, single quote, Helm, is it LS? And, oh, and Helm LS, and, yeah, okay. Okay, is there still an option for an overview to see them all at once? Yes, uh, it's the same way, and I'm trying to exit out of my presentation here, there we go. So I'm gonna actually switch to VS Code. It's the same way I would from Kubernetes, right? I do k get pods dash dash all namespaces. I can do the same thing with h3ls dash dash all namespaces. A lot of the changes were designed to be more Kubernetes native and what you would expect from interacting with the Kubernetes binary. And so you can actually see in this, I just did h3ls dash dash all namespaces. And then I have three defaults if I switch to JDK8, and I do the same command. I'm going to get, I think, Cube System, Croc Hunter, CF Croc Hunter. Now I have even more namespaces. So, yes. Okay. All right. Great. Unfortunately, uh, because of the t short time, that's the only question we're going to be able to get to. Um, but uh, please, if you if you have a question for Jessica later on, uh, you know, you can always. Uh, I'm sure, sure she'd be more than happy to to answer anything that you have offline. Um, but before we get uh, before we close out the webinar, I do want to do the drawing for the three fifty dollar Amazon gift cards, and our winners today are. Uh, let's see, Venkat Mani. Congratulations, Venkat. Our next winner is uh, Stephen Topley. Congratulations, Stephen. And our final winner is Indira Thangasami. Congratulations, Indira. And um, I want to remind the audience also that today's event has been recorded. So if you missed any or all of it, you will be able to watch it again. Um, 
the webinar is also going to be living on the devops.com website so you can always find it there just go to dev, devops.com slash webinars look in the on-demand section and it'll be right there waiting for you and then as i said at the top of the hour we are going to be sending out an email later on this afternoon that contain, contains a link to access the webinar on demand jessica thanks so much for giving such a great presentation lots of good stuff Thank you very much. Thank you again to the entire DevOps team and everyone for having me. Great, thanks. And I also want to thank the audience for joining me today. This is Charlene O'Hanlon and I'm signing off. Have a great day, everybody.